Miller, I'm the Director of the Journalism Program. It's wonderful to see you all here um, to uh, listen to our visiting journalist. Um, thank you for coming. I want to introduce to you now one of our wonderful students, Jacob Shutonier. Hi, everybody. Um, as Lisa said, I'm Jake Deschutin here. I'm a junior here at UNH, a uh, journalism major. Um, I work as a content editor for Main Street Magazine. Um, this evening, it's um, my sincere pleasure to introduce to everybody um, this year's visiting journalist, Chris Outcall. Um, like me and like many of you, Chris came through the journalism program here at UNH. He graduated from UNH in 2006, and it didn't take long for him to make an impression as a working journalist. The same year, he was named Rookie of the Year by the New Hampshire Press Association. Chris spent some time in New England after graduation practicing the fundamentals of reporting um, at Seacoast publications like York Weekly and the Portsmouth Herald. And then he followed his urge to go west, moving to Colorado, where he became um, an editor at the magazine 5280, a relatively young publication that covers uh, an eclectic scope of stories and subject matter in the Denver area. At 5280, Chris reports, writes, edits, and even sometimes codes in HTML. He has pursued his passion for narrative storytelling at the magazine, and uh, he's written a variety of articles um, from features about murder, uh, gas fracking, and from pieces about fashion, um, local spotlights, business, sort of some more lighthearted pieces. Um, he blogs regular, uh, regularly, and I think most importantly, he writes a lot about beer. Um, he has written um, a vast array of reviews of different, um, different beers uh, in the Denver area, and that's a very impressive uh, part of his uh, repertoire. Um, I've, I've had the chance to read some of Chris's writing over the past few days, and I've, just, I've been really impressed with um, you know, his, uh, just his, his youthful and modern um, voice and his sophisticated but innate storytelling ability. Uh, Chris is a, an exciting young voice in journalism, and he's a great example of uh, the excellence that the journalism program here at UNH breeds. Um, I think we're all lucky to have a chance to learn from him here in person this week as he visits our journalism classes. Um, and uh, obviously we're very lucky to have him here tonight to, to speak to all of us. So without any further ado, uh, help me in welcoming this year's Donald Murray visiting journalist, Chris Outcall. Thanks. Um, thanks. That was great. Uh, yes, beer writing is, is very important. If there's one thing that I can convey, that will be, no. <laughs> um, so thanks to the program. Thanks to, uh, thanks to Lisa and, and Jane and Andy and Sue and Tom and all the professor, you know, professors that, that I have had and that I've had the pleasure of uh, getting to know and speaking with while I've been here uh, just a couple days so far this week. Um, I came to UNH uh, back in 2002 thinking I would be a biochemistry major. Um, and I quickly abandoned that and uh, got interested in, I took an intro to news writing course with Lisa. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with it. I fell in love with the, um, with the questions and with the people and with the thinking and, and all these things that, that hopefully I'll, I'll talk about. Um, but I had a great time at this university and I had a great time discovering this program. Um, and it's, it's a real honor and pleasure to be asked to, to do this. So um, thank you, everyone. Thanks to the university and, and everyone. Um, so after, uh, oh, and I was going to mention, uh, I was actually mentioning this to Lisa. Uh, I, you know, I don't do a lot of public speaking. This is sort of the, the first kind of thing of this. And I, I, uh, I just thought I should thank my mother. Um, it seems to be something people do. And, and she's a wonderful lady. So uh, thanks to my mom. <laughs> Um, all right, so a few months ago, I guess now, Lisa sent me an email and asked um, if I would do this. And my first reaction was, geez, it hasn't been that long since I was sitting in these seats. Um, you know, I, I remember it. I remember it was uh, Jackie McMullen was the visiting journalist when I was here. And it was a real pleasure to sit and listen to her talk about her career and um, the things that she had accomplished and the way that she had made a space for women in sports journalism. Um, it's, it, she's had an incredibly admirable career. And it was really cool to 
it was really cool to sit and listen to her. So that started running through my mind as, as uh, Lisa had emailed me and, and asked me uh, to do this. Um, you know, there, besides Jackie, there's been a long list of people that have come through here, and, and they're, all very, um, they're all very impressive. This, this program has turned out some wonderful people, and um, so it's nice to be included. My initial thought was, wow, what, what have I learned? What could I say? What do I know? What, what can I convey to these students in just uh, six or seven years of doing this that um, would be meaningful and um, thoughtful and, and helpful? And uh, I've thought a lot about that. And uh, you know, I'm still not sure I know what the answer is. But, but one thing that that sent me down the line of thinking is that I'm proud of the work that I've done in the past six or seven years. Um, and I thought I might talk a little bit about what that sort of means to me and the skills that I feel like I've developed both here in the program and as a reporter in newsrooms and now as a magazine journalist and interested in narratives. You know, it, it, was, uh, it, it was interesting to, to just think about that. Um, but after being sort of scared and worried and uh, nervous, I thought, OK, well, I'll just talk about what I'm interested in. Um, so here's what I do know. Um, I guess naturally, I'll talk about, uh, oh, and I meant to mention this. Um, if this works. There we go, OK. So I'm going to talk about uh, storytelling and this idea that um, great stories have a soul. I was, I was uh, sitting down with a colleague of mine before I came to do this, and we were just chatting about storytelling and, and magazines, and I was telling her I was coming to do this, and I was, I, you know, I didn't know what to say to the students, and we were just batting back and forth ideas about what stories we've loved and what things they contain and the elements of them, and one of the things she mentioned to me was that great stories have a soul, um, and I was really struck by that idea. Uh, I was really struck by that idea, and I thought, I, you know, I agree with that. I like that. I, I wanted to explore that and talk about that. So that was something I decided to uh, name the presentation. Total, uh, you know, this is just my evolving take on this. I'm out there every day trying to learn, trying to figure out what's going on. Just being a part of this world as a journalist and living the life as a journalist, um, it's something I'm really proud to do and something I like doing. I have so much to learn, and so really this is just my two cents. Um, there are a lot of smart people out there to learn from, and, and you should, you know, as students in particular, uh, seek them out and learn from them. Um, so I, I happened to be chatting with her, and we were talking about this, this idea that stories have a soul and, uh, you know, narratives with a soul, and I thought I would share what I've little learned about that so far. Um, all right, so I went to the dictionary. I know this is sort of a cliche thing to do where you have a word, and you look it up in the dictionary, and what does it say, and then you examine it. And if somebody sent me a story with a lead like that that had a motif or something, I'd probably send it back and ask for something better, more creative. But I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to break my own rule. Um, so if you look up uh, Soul and Miriam Webster, you get this. The immaterial essence, animating principle, or actuating cause of an individual life. The spiritual principle embodied in human beings, all rational and spiritual beings. A person's total self. Um, so I started thinking about that, particularly that third one, a person's total self, and the idea that stories have souls. And if you swap out a couple words, you get this. The immaterial essence animating principle or actuating cause of an individual story. Or number three, a story's total self. Um, to me, this is the idea that, uh, and we were talking about this before, that um, you know, this, a story really being, something being this, you know, the sum of all of its parts ends up as a greater whole than just each individual thing that you put into it. And I think great stories are that. They're very much a collection of reporting and thinking and listening, and we're going to talk about some of those elements. And you put it all together and you examine it and you, you play with the structure and why do you start here and why do you go there and can you switch it around? But when you get all those things together and hopefully someone reads it and it Hopefully the idea is it sort of transcends itself in a way. It speaks to some larger themes, um, a story's total self. So I really started thinking about that. Um, here's my desk in Denver. Uh, you know, it's not very glamorous, um, kind of messy. Sorry about that. But uh, you can see I have a thing for note cards. Um, I try and jot down ideas and uh, phrases, and I've sort of developed this 
habit of doing that, jotting down whether it's something someone says to me or something I read somewhere, something a writer has tweeted or something a friend just mentions off the cuff. I try and jot down these moments of wisdom or what they've said or something that means something to me. And I collect them and I put them around me. Um, and I put them up here. And I just sort of, the idea is that if I'm amongst them, and I can, it's the sort of thing of a learning by osmosis. Um, so I've got these bits of knowledge, and I put them up in my cube. And I think it sort of represents who I am as a, uh, as a writer and as a journalist and, and the thoughts that I've sort of developed over time. Um, so I thought I'd share some of those, and maybe we can trace my career and some of those thoughts and figure out what uh, goes into stories with souls. So here's one. Uh, here's something I wrote down and put up in my cube. If you start a story, people want to know how it ends. So just start. Um, so my story, I'll start with my story. How about that? I started at UNH. We talked about that. I grew up in the Adirondacks. I came to UNH. I was a biochemistry major. We talked about that. I went into journalism. Um, I took the introductory to news writing course, and I was interested in it. Um, and although <laughs> These things seem very different, biochemistry and journalism, right? Maybe they have many, sim they actually have some similarities, I think, now that I've been thinking about it. Uh, asking questions, analyzing data. So you as a research scientist, you sit down and you look at what information is in front of you. What questions can you ask? How can you turn those into more questions? How can you turn those into answers? Um, and then I thought, you know, being the Donald Murray visiting journalist, I thought I should think, of, uh, I thought I should talk about Don for uh, a moment. I had um, the pleasure of, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Don when I was um, here at UNH. It was before he passed, and he was, uh, Lisa was kind enough to introduce me to him. I had lunch with him down at Young's. This is still when he was meeting with students. Um, and I remember going down there, and uh, I remember just that it was supposed to be, you know, a lot of students had gone and talked to him, and, and the staff always talked about him, and he was this sort of... Uh, this figure that was supposed to impart some sort of wisdom and uh, journalistic knowledge and wisdom about life. And I was so excited to go sit down and talk to him and really listen and see what he had to say. And so I went down um, to Young's. It was first thing in the morning. And uh, we're sitting down. We're having breakfast. Um, and, and I'm as I'm trying to recall those moments, I, I don't remember what, what jumps out at me. I don't remember a lot of specifics, but what jumped out at me about Don was he was so gentle and he was so kind and he was just a good person. He was generous with his time. He was generous with his thoughts. Um, and although I don't remember, you know, I don't remember coming away from that breakfast with this sort of omniscient uh, journalistic wisdom or power, I just remember being struck by how generous he was with his thoughts and with his time, and, and he was kind, and so I was struck by that. Um, it was, I guess it was the next year that I was, uh, so I, I had done an internship at the Portsmouth Herald um, through the program here, and I was hired as, as Jake mentioned, I was hired to work at the York Weekly, uh, and then I moved up and I worked at the Portsmouth Herald. Um, and I was a young reporter there, I was working a lot of weekends, I was working a lot of holidays as the young staffers do. Um, and the news came on, I think it was either a weekend or a holiday. I was one of the only people in the newsroom, and, and the news came down that, uh, that Don had passed. And I, there was a story to write, and I was terrified of writing it. Um, I was terrified of having to call the sources. You know, I, I had to call Lisa, and I think I reached out to Jane. And that was scary to have to write a story about um, a man that had such a journalistic aura about him. But I remembered how kind and gentle and thoughtful he was. Um, and I tried to think about that while reaching out to these people, while calling Lisa. Um, you know, it's one thing to go after a story, and it's another just to be a good person. And, and, and uh, I, you know, sitting down, I don't know if this story has a soul, but I thought it was interesting to share that moment. And what I remembered about Don was something I tried to uh, capture even in just you know writing this piece, and um, I thought I'd just read the beginning here. Pulitzer Prize winner Kevin Sullivan figures he'd still be mowing lawns in Maine if it weren't for Donald Murray. He's the only reason I'm in the business, said Sullivan, a staff writer for the Washington Post, who won the prize in 2003. Sullivan vividly remembers his first journalism class at the University of New Hampshire, which Murray taught. He took the course based on a recommendation from a friend who raved about Murray. 
He was so excited about the professor, I had to take the class, said Sullivan. I looked at him and thought, if this is what journalists are like, I want a piece of it. Um, I thought that that was, that was pretty cool. Um, so I went on, I, I, uh, I had that experience with Don, and I graduated from UNH, as we talked about. I went to work, on, uh, went for, to work for the York Weekly and the Portsmouth Herald. Um, and <clears throat> this is something else we've been talking about in classes this week. There's really been these moments in my career where I've, uh, you know, I've gone through and learned a lot of the basics here at school. And I've had a couple you know, reporting jobs at, at sort of basic you know, a community newspaper, the York Weekly, a small weekly paper. Um, the Portsmouth Herald, and I've learned a lot of basics uh, at those jobs, and I thought I'd just talk about what some of those things are, both, you know, this is, you know, this is stuff that you're learning in your classes, this is stuff that you're going to continue to learn as you go out and get jobs, and I, I think these are invaluable skills, um, no matter where you are, what kind of work you're doing, whether you're blogging, you're writing narratives, you're, whatever it is, this, this is the stuff that I think about when I sit down to do almost anything. Um, so get it right. This, is, right. this is like the foundation of journalism, right? Reporting, get it right. If it's wrong, it's no good. And we lose credibility, we lose a connection to our readers, which we're trying to work with. Um, so, oh, and by the way, reporting equals hard work. So all of this stuff is extremely hard work. And if you do the work, you'll be rewarded. But remember, this is hard work. So here's, a, here's another quote, remembering the, uh, the wisdom from my cube. My think is that there's no such thing for, as a bad idea for a story. Or perhaps what I mean is every idea for a story is bad until you make it good. Anytime I've written anything good, I've spent the vast majority of the composition process convinced it was an utter stinker. And they were stinkers until they weren't, at which point they were done. And the only way to get from one to the other is work. So reporting is hard work. Getting it right is important. I wanted to talk briefly about uh, getting it wrong. This is, um, this is I, don't, I don't know, we talked about this in class this morning, but so there's a story, there's, uh, this is a story that Philadelphia Magazine ran this month. I think it's the April issue of the paper, uh, of the magazine. And it's about, uh, it's about a, well, it, it was about a marine uh, sniper in Iraq. And the, there was a local uh, radio journalist who had, he had called into, this Marine vet had called into the uh, radio program and the, the journalist at the radio station had built up this uh, relationship with the Marine vet. Um, and they, they stayed in contact, they talked, they exchanged emails, and, and the reporter began to think there was a story here about a, about a sort of a troubled veteran. He had talked about his, um, his work as a sniper and all the people that he had killed and he was kind of haunted by those experiences. Um, and so the reporter thought he was onto something, and he, and he pitched the story to Philadelphia Magazine. And Philadelphia Magazine uh, took the story, and they ran it, and they fact-checked it. They, so magazines go through this process of fact-checking. They checked everything, although the main source in the story was uh, this Marine vet who had called in and said he had experienced all these things. So they were using him as the source. And the fact-checking department checked all his stories with him, and it ran. Looked like this. This was the spread. And as soon as it ran, people, st people in the community, the Philadelphia Magazine community, started to question elements of the story. Things seemed off. Um, well, it turns out the Marine vet was not a Marine sniper vet. He, he made up much of what he had said, and they ran it. So this is a bit of what the editor wrote. So they wrote a retraction. Uh, you know, it's still in the magazine. This is a bit of what the editor said in talking about the mistake. Earlier this week, two different readers contacted the magazine, each raising questions about the facts in a story that appears in Philadelphia Magazine's April issue, The War Within. The article written by Anthony Gargano, the popular WIP radio, tells the story of a former Marine sniper who claims to have killed scores of people during his tours of the Middle East and who now says he is haunted by what he did. The allegations from readers were serious enough that we immediately removed the story from our website. Then, in a series of phone calls, email exchanges, and text messages, Gargano and I confronted the subject of the article, John P. Boudreau, who is also its main source. In a series of conversations on Wednesday and Thursday, Boudreau, who claims a residence in Chester County, acknowledged that much of what he had told Gargano over the preceding several months, information he had also confirmed to the magazine's fact-checkers, was either embellished or flat-out fabricated. 
He continues to say he served in the Marines, a fact we are attempting to officially confirm. Now they're attempting to confirm this. We are attempting to officially confirm with the Marine Corps. He acknowledged that he was never a sniper and that many of the incidents he described to Gargano never happened. Uh, here's what the writer wrote in Getting It Wrong. In the article, The War Within, in Philadelphia Magazine's April 2013 issue, I thought I was writing about a man coping with his demons. Turns out, I was. Only they were a completely different set than I imagined. And so I sit here a fool, sickened that I'm unwittingly led, to the, led the magazine, a group of caring, diligent editors, and our readers into John Boudreaux's troubled world and his web of deceit. I recklessly ran the red lights that arose while writing this story and sped past all the basic reporting, which is heresy for a 22-year veteran of the craft. For that, I apologize. I should have seen it from a mile away, and I didn't see it from the nose to nose. And that describes how close the relationship had become since John Boudreaux called into my radio program a few years ago. He identified himself as a Marine, and I thanked him for his service, as I did each subsequent time he called, however infrequently, but enough that I recognized him. Um, you, you don't want to get it wrong. Don't get it wrong. Get it right. That, you, can't, you can't do that. It's, it's, it, it, it just it sickens me. Um, it's so important to get it right, and there being that example of, of getting it wrong, I thought that you know, students would particularly understand the implications of something like that. We were just talking with the, the TNH staff today of the importance of you know, conveying sensitive subjects in a, in a thoughtful way and, and treating that stuff with care and respect and um, getting it right is the start to doing that. Uh, okay, so questions. Um, after getting it right, you have to be able to ask questions as a journalist. Um, that's sort of a foundation of reporting, right? You go out, you talk to someone, you ask them a question. And then what comes next? Listening. Perhaps even more important than asking a question. Uh, this is a passage from, you guys might be familiar with John Krakauer, right? He wrote Into the Wild, Into Thin Air. He's a pretty well-known journalist. So here's a passage. This is a book called The New New Journalism. Um, and it's, an it's a long interview with Krakauer. But I wanted to pull out this particular passage uh, about listening. I'm a listener by nature. I grew up in a big family, three sisters, one brother. That was very contentious with everybody jabbering all the time. I was the quiet one. My mom says that I was the kid with the Norwegian temperament. She's descended from Scandinavians. I can listen to women talk among themselves for hours. I don't go into an interview with a long list of questions. I just get my subject talking, make sure there are fresh batteries in the tape recorder, and sit back and listen. The, the interview takes the form of a pleasant, largely one-sided conversation. Um, to me, this is important, really listening to a subject, really listening to what they have to say. Um, if you're going to go out and ask somebody a question, you owe it to them to listen to the answer. And I'm not just, just talking about you know, even a recorder, just getting it down, really hearing what they have to say. And if you want to tell a story, you better be able to listen to people and what they have to say. Um, I, I don't think we can stress that one enough either. Listening is, is, a, big, is a big skill that I think about. Um, all right, next we've got uh, thinking. So once you've figured out what questions you're asking, once you're thinking about listening, you have to think about what you have, what information is in front of you. Think. This is another one, wisdom from my cube. Most writing doesn't take place on the page. It takes place in your head. Um, I don't know if you guys ever do this where you, uh, you sort of zone out or you sit and you stare out the window and you start writing things in your head. Um, this is another thing that I picked up as a, a newspaper reporter. I would go out to, uh, say it's a, a, you know, a car crash, and you go to the scene, and you ask questions, and you listen to the answers, and you gather all your facts. And then as I would drive back to the newsroom, I'd start writing the lead in my head. OK, what's the information? What comes to the forefront of my mind? What am I thinking about? That's what's going to be important. And I would start thinking about that as I drove back to the newsroom. I'd already have a couple ideas of, of nuggets or of details or of facts that, that I could then sit down at the computer and start working with. Um, so thinking critically. So last important, but uh, you know, and then get it right is on there again for good measure. But um, I think last, but, but certainly not least, is um, be a good person. And I can't stress this enough. With all the, you know, with all the, um, we talk about get it right and, and people missing the boat on, on facts or, or publishing a story that's inaccurate or uh, you know, everything that swirls around about journalism today, I try and use this as a rudder. Be a good person. Empathy, this is one that I tack up in my cube. 
the, uh, the, the action of understanding, being aware of, or being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another, either the past or present, without having the feelings, thoughts, or experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. So the idea that if you're going to write a story about someone, you better be able to try to understand what they're feeling, what they're thinking, what's going on, and be a good person. Use that as a guide. Um, I think that's an important one. So it brings me back to the, to the Don Murray story that I wrote, and I wanted to read a little bit more. And I think this is an instructive, and we'll see what people said about, about Don. Um, and I know he's been a good person to this program, and I thought he'd be a good example here. Um, so this is more of the story that I wrote uh, for the Herald. Murray won a Pulitzer Prize in 1954 for editorials he wrote for the Boston Herald. In addition to his column, Now and Then, which appeared in the Boston Globe on Tuesdays, he published numerous memoirs and books on writing and founded the journalism program at the University of New Hampshire, where he taught for 19 years. Lisa, a journalism professor at UNH, still uses many of the teaching messages that Murray stressed while he was there. He set the tone for everything, said Miller. The way we concentrate on good writing and use conferences and stress revision is all because of him. As grand as his contribution, contribution was to the world of journalism, the impressions he left on those he met were just as strong. I think that's one of the most amazing things about Don, said Miller. He touched so many people and so deeply. He was always generous with his time and with his advice. He was just a good human being and a good man, said Sullivan. He inspired me by the way he laughed and how much he loved life and how much fun he had doing what he did. I think that's a pretty cool thing for people to say about you. He was just a good human being and a good man. We should all be so lucky as to, to have that. So be a good person when you're out there talking to people, trying to tell their stories. Um, so we're back at my desk. And after learning all these things from newspapers and, and uh, you know, really stressing the basics and reporting and questioning and listening and being a good person, I sort of had this wanderlust. And Jake talked about it. I, I moved out to Denver. Um, and I became interested in magazine narratives. Um, and I tried to. Uh, forge a path to a magazine. I was just drawn to the stories that they were telling on those pages and uh, the characters and the, the, um, the words in, in certain magazines were, were uh, you know, I was just compelled to them. So uh, I, took, I did two internships. Um, after working at a newspaper in Vail for a little while, I did two internships. I did one at uh, Ski Magazine, unpaid internships. Um, did one at Ski Magazine and then I did one at 5280 Magazine where I am now. Uh, before I was lucky enough to get the job um, after I, it was about a few months after I had finished my internship that a position had opened and they had, uh, they had considered me. So um, I was lucky enough to get that, that gig. Um, and I started to develop, so I've, I've developed these basics of reporting as I was a newspaper uh, reporter at the York Week and the Herald. And then I've, as I've um, worked at magazines and, and gotten more interested in magazine narratives, um, I've started to continue to add to that bank of, of stuff that I'm calling upon. So feature characters rather than sources. More wisdom from my cube, um, and I thought I would. Uh, I thought I would read a couple things that I was drawn to as a as a young journalist who had gone through the newspaper world and now was interested in getting to mag into magazines. Um, these are leads from a couple different stories that that struck me, so I wanted to read them. Judy Padilla was the last person you'd have pegged as a bomb builder. Five feet, two inches tall, with platinum blonde hair, she looked no more threatening than the pearl white 75 beetle that sat in the driveway of her Adams County home. Her idea of profanity was shoot and booger. But Judy was stubborn, ambitious, and energetic, with the kind of piston-quick spirit that got her up every morning to ringlead the family circus. She'd make breakfast and bag lunches for her three kids, feed the two lap dogs, and kiss her husband, Charlie, goodbye as he left for another morning shift on the factory floor at AT&T. Later in the afternoon, Judy would leave for her own job. On her way out of the house, she'd reach for a small hook in the pantry door and grab a baseball card-sized instrument called a dosimeter. Uh, this is from a story in 5280 Magazine written by Mike Kessler. Uh, he had left the magazine before I um, got there. But I started to get, I was drawn to the details and the, the pace and, and paragraphs like this in magazines. I wanted to read another one from 5280. This is by a colleague of mine, Lindsay Kohler. It hasn't snowed in days, but the chill and wind remain. Randy Hansen is in no hurry to leave the warmth of his chair, but he feels compelled. He scans the desolate expanse outside his car window, a seemingly endless open field of frosted grass. 20 minutes, he tells himself. It's worth being outside in the cold for 20 minutes to be able to cross this one off the list. 
The detective shoulders open the door, pulls a black wool cap tight onto his bald head, and walks into the field, his winter overcoat flapping in the wind. A former college football player, Hanson is tall and still possesses the kind of trim, sculpted physique that many men in their 40s have let slip away. Hanson typically exudes a formidable presence, but now in this field in Nowhere Aurora, he looks anything but. So hopefully we're getting at some storytelling here. I'm drawn to this, the, again, the details, the pace, the people. These paragraphs are about people, right? Here's another one. This is uh, written by Mike Sager. He's a writer at Esquire who I had the pleasure of uh, recently meeting. She loves big silver cowboy buckles and chewy red Swedish fish, three-inch Gucci stiletto heels and Lamborghini trucks. She hates being alone. She doesn't kiss on the first date. She feels high highs and low lows, often in rapid succession. Sometimes you'll pu she'll push you away because she wants you to try again. She's been offered $30,000 for one night. Her toes are long like fingers. One of them sports a silver ring. She has a tiny tattoo of a cottontail bunny on the nape of her neck, a souvenir of a drunken night in the town with her two best friends, former Playboy centerfolds. She loves backgammon, bowling, dive bars, sunbathing in the nude, gambling in Las Vegas, blackjack, baccarat, pie gal. She loves French lingerie, always in matching sets and scented candles, oodles of them, all over the room. She loves the word love and the words romance, ambiance, intimacy, and hot. She's been kidnapped by a bodybuilder, stalked by a Persian nightclub owner, electronically surveilled by an Israeli mobster, relieved of her worldly possessions by a family of wealthy Egyptians, sued by a downstairs neighbor who claimed that her vocal lovemaking destabilized his energy. Incredible detail, right? Um, so, another thing that I started to, to uh, that I started to come to realize was that the idea of stories, not subjects. And we were talking about this in a class this week. So, those are stories, right? Those are people. Here's more wisdom from my cube. Um, this was a question that was asked of a staff writer or perhaps executive editor of Texas Monthly. Um, what's the best piece of narrative advice anyone ever gave you? The former editor of Texas Monthly, Evan Smith, used to always say the same thing when I would pitch him an idea that he wasn't sold on. That's a subject, not a story. It took me years to figure out the difference between the two. But to me, finding those characters and details and narrative arcs that make a story a story is what long-form journalism is all about. So characters rather than stories, stories, not subjects. These are all things I'm starting to think about and learn in the magazine world that I've built on top of this layer of get it right, ask questions, listen. Um, here's an example that, uh, that I did. So we, recently at the magazine, we did a story on fracking, natural uh, gas, hydraulic fracturing, which I guess I'll just do the quick uh, the version on that. Um, so fracking is a process that oil and gas companies are using to unlock uh, oil and gas underneath, the, so seven, 10,000 feet underneath the surface, locked in these dense rock formations. Um, they inject a cocktail of chemicals and sand and water at high pressures under the ground, it breaks up these rock formations. And the sand pops open the cracks and keeps them open. And then the oil and gas seep back to the surface. So this has become an important topic in Colorado. It's happening more and more. It's a, it's a word that um, our readers and our community became more familiar with. Um, familiar in the sense that they heard it, but we weren't sure that they knew much about it. So it became something that we felt like we had to tackle. But fracking is a subject, right? Not a story. So, and, and this was a big package. It was 12 pages of, of, of different stories. But here's, one, here's just one snippet of something we tried to pick off. This was something I wrote. It was afternoon when Carol Bell first noticed the steak. She had just returned home from a trip to the grocery store. The wooden post protruded from the dirt not more than a few feet. There was a small orange flag near the top of the steak, which was just footsteps from a horse barn owned by Carol and her husband Orland and a few hundred feet from their home both located on the Bell's 110-acre ranch in Silt, Colorado. Carol felt ill the moment she saw the stake. It seemed that someone had fired a warning shot, unmistakably meant to convey one thing. So this is a story, right? We want to know what's going to happen to these people. The stories are about people and emotion, and she's worried, and what is going to happen? Fracking is a subject. So I started to go through all these things, and then we haven't even talked about writing. So after all that, you've got to sit down and you've got to write something. So you've, you've, uh, we've talked about getting it right. We've talked about um, 
questions, listening, being a good person, uh, you know, stories, not subjects. Um, and then you have to sit down and write something. So what I, what I try and think about when I sit down to write is keep it simple. We've all heard uh, KISS, keep it simple, stupid, right? This is important, but hard. Not easy to do simple. Um, clarity. Clarity is like if I get confused when I'm reading a story just as a reader, if I get confused in the beginning, I'm already lost. I, I put it down. It has to be clear. If the lead is confusing, I'm going to stop reading. Promise. That was something an editor said to me at, at the, a colleague where I work now. More wisdom from the cube. Uh, this is a list of things that Kurt Vonnegut, fiction writer, uh, uses. Every sentence must do one of two things, reveal character, advance the action. Efficiency in writing. Um, so I started thinking about you know, all these things that I've gone through in my career and all these things that I've kind of collected and all these things that I try and live by. And, and uh, sorry about this picture, it's a little distorted. But um, as I was getting ready to come here and try and talk about some of this stuff and try and say some of these things, uh, I began to remember Don and think about the time that I met him, and just naturally because it's named the Don Murray Visiting Journalist. Um, and so I picked up, a, I had a couple of his books, and I picked up this book, and I started reading it, um, and I started trying to remember that day that I had breakfast with him, and although there weren't any particular moments, I remembered he was gentle and he was kind, but there were no particular moments of wisdom necessarily that... You know, it's hard to pinpoint a specific thing that he said or that he told me that I now think that's what I, you know, I, I, I focus on that. But I picked up this book and I started reading it. Um, and I had marked it up. And I had noticed that one thing that, that me as of six years ago had marked was this. Uh, and, and Don is giving an answer about storytelling. This is a Q&A that ran in this book, but I'll just read this one little snippet. Once the characters have revealed themselves and what they are doing to each other, go back and paste the scene with the minimum amount of description necessary to put the dramatic action in context and to reveal the characters and the texture of their world. And he cites Vonnegut. Don't put anything in a story that does not reveal character or advance action. So I, I was just struck by that moment. I had, I had um, you know, Don didn't say that to me when I met him years ago. It wasn't something that I had written down, but. I had sort of forged my own path through newspapers and now into magazines, and I had tacked that bit of knowledge up in my cube. Um, I found it somewhere on my own. And when I went back and read this, uh, you know, Don was citing that as well. And so somehow I got there. Somehow I found it. I don't know if it was something he said to me or it was something that, um, I, I don't know how I discovered it, but I thought it was interesting that, you know, Don had said that, and I, I found my own way there. Um, so a story's total self, we started by talking about that. And uh, to me, it's all those things. It's, um, you know, it's listening. It's being a good person. It's questions. It's thinking. Um, and I thought I would read a bit of a piece that I wrote, which was sort of my, really my first attempt to kind of put that all together. Um, it was a story about a murder in Vail. Uh, I had lived up there, but this happened after I... Um, after I had left, there was a, uh, it had been about three decades since there had been a murder in Vail. It's not a, it's not a town with a big um, crime. You know, there's, there's DUIs, but there's, you know, guns. There's, there's not much violence. So this was shocking when this happened. Of course, it would be no matter what, but unexpected. Um, and I, I started just, I, you know, I was reading the local news coverage of it, and I was just thinking about, about this person and uh, how did this happen? How did he get to the point where he walked into the bar with a gun and started shooting? Um, turns out he had been a member of this community for a long time. Uh, you know, he had lived there almost 30 years. He wasn't an outsider. Um, so this story of what happened was a story I was interested in telling. And... Um, it was one I tried to tell using a collection of all these thoughts and things that I put together as a reporter and as a student and as a newspaper reporter, a community reporter, a city reporter, now as a magazine editor. Um, I thought I would just read a bit of it. Uh, I don't have a slide, but I'll just read. So this is the beginning. This is the first section of the story. This is the lead, A Murder and Veil. Somewhere around 7.30 p.m. on that night last November, Richard Moreau clenched the handle of his 45 caliber semi-automatic handgun and walked into the Sandbar Sports Grill. 
Short and burly, the 63-year-old had a crazed look in his deep-set eyes, an unkempt gray beard, and three nickel-sized snowflakes tattooed on his left cheek. Jim Lindley happened to be standing in Moreau's line of sight. Wrong place, wrong time. Just like everyone else in the bar. It didn't seem like it at that moment, but Lindley was lucky. Lucky Moreau wasn't holding one of his rifles or his 12-gauge semi-automatic sawed-off shotgun or one of his 19 swords. Moreau fired two rounds at Lindley. One of the shots shattered his left elbow. Moreau paused to reload. The low was just long enough for Lindley to wonder why a man he'd never met was shooting at him. Another minute and Lindley wouldn't have been there. Done with his taco in Sierra Nevada, he had dropped money in the bar and was headed home to pack for a California trip to see family. Moreau fired two more rounds. Lindley's knees buckled and his body smacked the sticky bar floor. Moreau moved past Lindley deeper into the bar. Outside, about a length of a football field away from the bar, a woman stood in the Westvale Mall parking lot adjacent to a McDonald's, gasping at the mountain air. She'd just watched a sandbar staffer get shot. She was the first to dial 911. Um, I, someone's shooting at the sandbar. I'm sorry, what? I said a guy is shooting in the sandbar. There's an actual gun? Yes, an actual gun. No one could have faulted the dispatcher for double checking the report of an actual gun. After all, this was Vail, the ski resort town where there's not much crime, let alone shooting sprees. We need an ambulance and the cops, the woman shouted into the phone, now. Moreau had made his way to the corner of the bar. He sat against the ground to a table near the kitchen. His back pressed against the wall and his feet spread in front of him in the shape of a V. His shoulders drooped, his right arm was outstretched parallel with the ground and his fingers were still wrapped around his handgun. He looked like a man who was at once defeated and defiant, resigned to whatever had happened and whatever may come next. Gary Kitching, an adventurous and fit 70-year-old, wandered around the corner of the bar directly opposite Moreau. Wrong place, wrong time. Kitching was likely looking for his wife, Lanny, who was hiding behind a nearby coffee table and couch. If only the couple had opted to watch the University of Southern California football game at home in Carbondale. Moreau aimed at Kitching and pulled the trigger without any visible hesitation. The former Navy lieutenant crumpled. Moreau pointed his gun at the motionless Kitching and fired twice more, three shots in all, arm, thigh, chest. From his seated position, Moreau slid down along the wall until he was lying on the ground, only a few feet from where Kitching was bleeding, dying. The woman in the parking lot called 911 at 7.28 p.m. 29 minutes later, Lieutenant Greg Daly of the Avon P Police Department found Moreau in the corner of the bar. Daly turned his handgun on Moreau and ordered him to drop his weapon. Moreau asked Daly to go ahead and shoot me. Daly wrestled Moreau's gun from his hand and cuffed him. The Vail Police Officer, Vail Police Officer Ryan Milburn got to Moreau shortly after Daly. Milburn recognized the shooter. Milburn knew him as many folks around, now, around town knew him by his nickname, Rossi. He'd also seen Moreau's name around the Vail Police Department on a list of locals to watch. When Milburn reached him, Moreau was babbling and blurted, do you know how long I've been trying not to do this? So that, that story was an attempt for me um, at, at putting kind of all that together and, and telling a story with a soul. You know, I don't, I don't know if that story has a soul, and, and I hope it does, and that's something that I think about a lot, and, and all of that is something that I, I think that I think about a lot. But um, it was an attempt to do that, and, and it's something I'm proud of, and, and those, uh, those pieces and moments of my career and those things that I think about are things that I'm proud of. So when I sat down to, to think about what could I say to students and, and what do I know as someone who's very young and learning, um, that's what I know. Question, listen, be a good person, think, listen again, get it right. Um, characters, not sources, stories, not subjects. Um, that's it. That's what I think about when I sit down to, to be a, you know, I'm, like, I'm excited about this profession. It's a lifestyle that I like living and it's a thing I like doing. Um, and when I sit to do it, sit down to do it, that's what I think about. So, um, thanks. We've been doing so many questions and answers and classes. They may have all the questions. Yeah. Any other questions? What's the fact checking like at your magazine? Is that for what is that? Like, 
this story was horrifying on so many levels, and one of them is the complete misunderstanding of what fact checking is. Right, like, totally. Like well, facts and, with a value of and a misunderstanding of what reporting is, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, so, so the so the fact checking process at our magazine is is pretty extensive. Um, we have a re, it's called a research editor, which is a full time position dedicated to running a team of uh, freelancers and interns who fact check everything in the magazine. Um, so you know it's it's an interesting process. We do hand uh, so for instance, take that veil story. When I was done with it. I annotated the entire thing, sentence by sentence by sentence by sentence. I went and wrote the source for each of those sentences in the margin of the uh, of the story. So I would just I would bracket, or if it was a paragraph, I would bracket that paragraph and write in the margin, this is the source, or these are the multiple sources. And they go back and they re-report the whole thing. Um, but maybe there's a disconnect there about about at least in that case of the Philadelphia magazine story that that they would never that they would never check that he was a Marine even, that they would never even have a piece of paper that said, yep, he was in this company or this troop or with these people, They're, you know, just, just nothing. Even something basic like that is, is, is pretty appalling. And, um, you know, we can't be trusted if we can't get things right like that. And, and that's so important in journalism today. Um, so we, we make a point to, to check all that stuff, but that goes to show you it's still on the reporter at some point. And, and that one, you know, starts there. Yeah. I, I wish we had more time to ask you about what a good story consists of and how you generate business. Obviously, a lot of art here. It takes a while to talk about. But sure, just, yeah. Instead, I'll just ask a dumb nuts and bolts question. Okay. About, about how you feel magazine art and the art of telling your story has been affected by electronic media. When, when, person is using a website and they only have a few seconds to decide to read a story or decide how far to go. You know, the, the, the quick and, and facile communication means has changed things. How do you think that mm -hmm. affected your art? Well, I think interest, what's interesting about that is that I think that, that moment where someone started to read something and decided whether to, to stop or to start or to keep going is, has always been the same. I mean, you pick up a newspaper story and you read the first sentence and if it's not interesting, if it's not compelling, I'm not going to keep going. And that's the same with a story on a website. So if I pull up a blog and I start reading and I'm not interested, it's not compelling, it doesn't seem informative, there isn't something there for me as a reader, um, then I stop. So I think that that's the, the key. And whether we present that information that's uh, interesting, compelling, thoughtful, informative, whatever the criteria are, if we send it to you on a, on a mobile phone, you know, we should try and reach you with that information in the way that you want to be reached. So if it's on a phone, we send it to you on your phone. If it's on an iPad, if it's in print. But it has to be quality, and it has to be compelling and interesting. And no matter how we deliver it, it better have those elements in it. Um, so I think about it in that sense that no matter where we send it to you, it better be good, and it better be interesting, and it better be something that you as a reader of whatever community, uh, whether we're talking about Denver, or here in the seacoast um, matters to you. You think it warps the style? Though? That's really the crux of the question. Well, it depends. I mean, there's all kinds of different styles. St style of like a narrative piece, or of a of a blog, or. Well, I guess I'm thinking that many people are trying to read magazines on their tablet. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, do I think that that sort of uh, has an effect on the reading experience? On the experience and, and on the style that you have to write to. I mean, the format you have to use, the, the approaches you use as a journalist. I guess I don't think it changes the, that approach very much. And I think people consume it in the way that they want to consume it. So I think that that's comfortable for them. If they want to read that story on an iPad, then they're comfortable reading on an iPad. And we better deliver them the same quality of story wherever they want it. So, so I don't think it, you know, I think a lot of the stuff is, is the same. I think those core principles are the same. The lead better be good. It better make you want to keep reading. Whether we send it to you on an iPad or we beam it into your brain or what, it better be good. Thank you very much.